So buying gold is pretty easy. Selling gold is also pretty easy. Just as long as you think about a few things and you keep clear of a few others to make sure that you bought the gold, that's pretty easy to sell. I talk about using gold off and on around here. I think anyone buying this stuff should have a good idea of what it takes to sell or hand it down. I think we should all think about that before we get in too deep. Always having an exit strategy is just good planning. Now in the case of gold, selling a gold coin, it's a pretty easy transaction, but at scale, there's always more to it. Now some of that comes down to personal considerations and some of this actually involves tax law. If I went into a coin shop and I sold all the gold on the desk carry in one shot, for instance, it'd be a lot different than selling a single coin. If I get hit by a bus, my kids inherit this stuff and they go in to sell the gold on the desk. Well, it's a different set of considerations. So it's no longer as simple. And don't worry, I'm not here to try to make any of this seem complicated. I'm just going to run through a few things that I think we should all be thinking about to prevent those complications that might come down the road. Now, before we jump into all that, though, Summit Metals just happens to have gold and silver, and they also keep things simple. Good prices, fast shipping, good people. They have it all. So be sure to check them out at summitmetals.com. I keep showing these one tenth ounce coins and their cool carry cases, but they have other things. I just like the way this looks. So let's start with a quick note on size. Personally, I like one ounce gold coins. I like American gold eagles and buffaloes. I like gold maple leaves simply because those three are the most popular anywhere that I spend time. I can sell them at any time without any trouble. Now, I like the one ounce coins because they have the lowest premiums. They have the lowest buy to sell spread. And for the kind of emergency use that I plan for, really, I shouldn't need a smaller dollar amount. Now, to the extent that I'm saving them to hand down to my kids, they are also probably the easiest to understand. That doesn't mean that's all I like, though. I've mentioned here that my scheduled purchases for seven years were primarily quarter ounce eagles. So it isn't anything more than math to me there. Quarter ounce coins, they come with a higher premium, but I think from a size perspective, they're actually a really nice size. If we were to compare it to the Roman Aureus, the high denomination coin used for something like four centuries, well, a quarter ounce gold coin is actually slightly larger. So it's not something silly like fractional seems too small to me. I actually think a quarter ounce gold coin seems pretty significant. Now, I'm not here to make an argument for or against one ounce or fractional gold coins, but there are a few things to consider beyond premium, things that make fractional a better option in certain cases. And there's just a lot to consider, including death and taxes, both of which we're going to cover here. Now, I realize not all of us live in the United States and you all need to realize I'm not a tax professional, but there are several very specific considerations I think anyone in the United States needs to be aware of. And there are a few general things I think all of us need to be aware of. Here in the United States, we have a few things to consider. The first is that if you receive $10,000 or more in a single transaction cash payment from a gold or silver dealer, you are supposed to file a form 8300. They're actually required to report it. Now that's a FinCEN anti-money laundering requirement, more than a tax claim, but it's a paper trail similar to what you'd have if you were issued a check. Now, a lot of you might think local buys and sales are cash only. Well, some are, some aren't. Some are off the record, some are on. So before we get too worked up here, there probably are cases where you might want a paper trail on a large transaction. I can give you an example. If you were to show up at a bank with $200,000 in cash as a down payment on some property you wanted to purchase, well, the underwriters are probably going to need an explanation. Showing up at the duffel bag full of $100 bills just isn't really something we get to do. So this isn't all bad, but there are points where it can be painful. Maybe you've heard of the form 1099B. Well, in certain cases, the sale of gold or silver or platinum will trigger an extra tax form. This is specifically about capital gains taxes. Now, I realize not everyone watching is from the United States, so let's get a coin size comparison in here while I explain quickly. And then I'll get back to the considerations that affect any of us. Now, if you sell 25 or more one ounce gold maple leaf, gold Kruger and or gold Mexican on the coins, it will immediately be reported to the IRS using a 1099B form. And the same is true for one kilogram gold bars in any quantity, 1,000 ounce silver bars in any quantity, or $1,000 face value of constitutional silver. 
So nothing on the desk here right now is supposed to add up to that 1099B form requirement. These maple leafs are fractional. Now the reason these form filings can be a pain isn't just about the tax requirements. Having a form 8300 or a form 1099B filed in and of itself really shouldn't be a big deal. We all know we're required to report gains on our annual tax returns. Wink, wink. Just kidding. If you buy a gold coin for $1,000, you sell it for $2,700. The delta there is $1,700. That's what's taxed at a maximum of 28% for long-term capital gains. Now, if those were the numbers, it would be long-term. If you bought a gold coin, though, and sold it in less than a year, well, the gains then would be taxed as ordinary income. Pretty straightforward. And there are worse things than paying capital gains taxes. I mean, you could have a loss, but there's more even than that. Now, one situation would be having a 1099B submitted on my behalf that led to an inquiry where I would have to prove my cost basis and any related expenses so that wasn't set at zero. So if I bought the coins with cash, received them in trade, or simply just don't have a receipt or proof of payment, well, the inquirer could say my cost basis is zero. So that $2,700 coin sale would now be pure profit and the 28% tax would apply to the entire amount. Now, this is also one more line item to scrutinize on a tax return. So again, I pay my taxes. I don't mind paper trails, but these forms take away any choice that any of us would have in the matter. So you're no longer self-reporting and the transactions are no longer simple. Now, I mentioned death and taxes. Well, on the upside of you dying, if you hand your gold down to an heir, at the time of your death, the cost basis immediately steps up to the cost of gold at the time of inheritance. So that's actually a very good thing. Now, remember, I'm not a tax professional, but you can see the benefit of including gold in estate planning here because your heirs could go from the reading of the will straight to the coin shop and they would have no tax burden. Now, let's say you taught them right. They're not going to sell immediately. Well, everything that I've mentioned up to now, now applies to them as they go. Let's say you live for 30 years and these laws are still in the books. Well, a single ounce of gold might now be worth $10,000. So every sale of any one ounce gold coin now gets filed with FinCEN through that form 8300. So yeah, that's where the fractional is nice because again, we aren't here to talk about skipping out on taxes, but your heirs would now be self-reporting. They wouldn't have additional filings or suspicious line items that I have to imagine would simply add a little bit more unnecessary attention, especially 30 years down the path we seem to be on. So let's be clear here. I don't think gold should be taxed, but unfortunately, I don't get to make the rules. These laws are very clear, though. If you read the laws upside down, you actually get a pretty clear idea of what you can do to avoid all this extra work. Eagles and buffaloes, for instance, they will not get you a 1099B. It doesn't matter how many you sell. Transactions below $10,000 will not get you a Form 8300. So if you plan around all that, you're back in charge of keeping it simple or just making it simple for future generations. Now, these are all things that are pretty easy to plan around. These are things I planned around right up until that tragic boating accident where I lost it all. Now, I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't mention that last bit of advice here. Never take your gold on a boat. It has a way of disappearing. Okay, let's call it good there before I get into trouble. Joking about death and taxes, typically a bad idea, but... Here we are. So let's say for the record, none of this is about trying to avoid either one of those. We're just shedding some light on a few laws, a few regulations that most of us might not be real familiar with. It's better to know about them now than to find out about them sometime down the road, the hard way. So let us know what you think. If you make decisions for any of these reasons, if you have other reasons, hit us in the comments. And then while you're there, be sure to hit the like button if you found any of this interesting. Be sure you're subscribed with notifications turned on if you want to hear more on the topic. And if you're still here, thanks again for watching. I always appreciate your time. Take care.